All right. Welcome, everyone, to the seminar. Um, so today, I'm delighted to introduce you to, to Jeremy Borhill, who's coming from the University of Western Australia. Um, so Jeremy is a postdoc working in the, the group there um, of, uh, of Mike Tobar. Um, and they're involved in in various uh, centers of excellence, for example, the Dark Matter Center and and uh, and uh, Center for Engineering uh, Quantum Systems. Um, so, like uh, a lot of the activities down there, they, they're they're doing a lot of work uh, specifically on on axion halescopes, and that's exactly what we're going to hear about today from Jeremy. It's uh, one of their exciting new uh, designs for uh, a halescope for very very light axions. So, thank you for uh, agreeing to give the seminar, Jeremy, and I'll I'll leave it in your hands. Okay. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks for that. Can you hear me? Yeah. I think I just lost connection yeah. for a little yeah, moment yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, you know. Okay, great. I'll, I'll get started. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that introduction. So as Kieran said, um, we do a lot of Axion direct detection experiments here at UWA. Um, this is a sort of um, new type on that, um, a bit of putting a bit of a twist on it. Um, which maybe that joke will be funny in a minute. Um, so the title of this talk is Searching for Ultralight Axions with Twisted Cavity Resonators of Anion Rotational Symmetry with Bulk Modes of Non-Zero Helicity. And I'll be the first to admit that that's a very wordy title. There's a lot going on there. Um, and hopefully we'll sort of break it down one by one and, and that'll make sense in a little bit. Um, okay, so... Um, some of you, hopefully most of you will have seen um, this figure before. It's a, a bunch of theoretical solutions for dark matter. Um, and in this uh, bottom left-hand corner is the axion-like particles, QCD axion and axion dark matter. Um, and this is the particular candidate for dark matter particle um, that, that we spend a lot of time looking at, looking for here at UWA. Um, and this particular um, talk will focus on. Um, another way to represent um, some of those theoretical solutions is on a uh, on, on a mass chart such as this, um, where we see there are 80 orders of magnitude um, to search for the dark matter particle, um, which is a very, very large parameter space to search. Um, and in particular, this ultra light area, this region is is, is quite quite challenging um, below uh, Below, you know, ten to the minus fourteen electron volts, there's there's not a lot of um, direct detection experiments that can operate in this regime. Um, so I've stolen these um, exclusion plots from from Kieran. Um, we can see that the twisted anion cavity. There's a projection exclusion. Um, that's that's this this. Um, the subject of this talk here is this twisted anion cavity. Um, it sort of covers a parameter space that that no one else can really operate in, um, in this really ultra light mass regime. Um, so it, it's it's pretty interesting. It's um, the fact is, of that is due to a pretty unique property of this particular experiment. Um, for reference, this is um, where all of the the sort of more famous experiments, ADMX and organ, um, sit in the mass range that are searching for axions up in this um, you know micro electron volt range. Um, all of these halescopes, you can see them there. Um, so we're, we're we're operating in a in a very different mass range here. Um, okay, so axions as a dark matter particle candidate. Um, they solve two very big problems in physics. Um, the, the origin of the axion comes from the strong CP problem, which is a fine tuning problem originating from quantum chromodynamics and says, why should charge parity symmetry be conserved um, in, in, in the strong interaction? Um, it, it's related to um, the absence of a um, electric dipole moment on the neutron. Um, so, there was this symmetry proposed by Pecky Quinn um, that when it is broken gives rise to a pseudoscalar field, which can be interpreted as a new particle, which is the axion. Um, and this solves the strong CP problem and, and it effectively um, uh, forces the, the, um, the charge parity symmetry to be conserved in QCD. Um, so working out that that would result in new particles done by Frank Wilczek. Um, and the properties of this particle um, make it an excellent dark matter candidate um, because it is predicted to have a very, very weak interaction with electromagnetism, which means we wouldn't have observed it 
um, yet. Um, and it should be in existence in the early universe, um, both of which um, both properties make it an excellent dark matter candidate. Um, it was termed the Axion um, because of a cleaning product um, called Axion, um, because it cleans up uh, two problems at once. Um, and the crux of the technologies that we work on here at UWA are to do with this inverse Primakov effect, the Feynman diagrams over here, where some axion is going to come along, interact with a magnetic field, B, and produce a photon. Um, and then that photon will have a frequency related to the mass of the axion, um, and that photon is what our systems try and detect. Um, so as I said, and as Kieran mentioned, um, UWA has for a long time now been working on a particular haloscope experiment called the organ experiment. Um, this is work that's been done by uh, PhD student Aaron Quizcamp and Ben McAllister, um, who's now at Swinburne. Um, and essentially the way these experiments work is to apply a very, very strong magnetic field across a microwave frequency resonator, um, ideally with a high Q. Um, what will happen um, according to that inverse Primakov effect is that the axion field will come along, interact with the magnetic field, produce a photon, which will then become resonantly enhanced by, by your resonator um, and then detected out through some amplification and, and, and mix down stage. Um, the power of your output signal is, is up top here um, and it's proportional to the axion photon coupling strength, which is a model parameter you're gonna try and set a limit on. Um, this form factor C, which is proportional to the dot product of the electric field in the cavity and the applied magnetic field. So this is a really important concept for what's to come next, that to be sensitive to axions, you want to have parallel E and B fields in your experiment. Um, there's some other experimental parameters that, that go into the power of this signal. Um, and yeah, essentially what you're looking for in, in a halo experiment is some um, increase in power um, on top of the thermal noise of, of, your, of your cavity. Um, so that experiment is running now. Um, and that's sort of, I guess, the traditional way to try and find axions. Um, an alternative proposal um, was developed in uh, 2021 by Katriona Thompson um, here at UWA. Um, it was called the upload experiment, and it's sort of a new way to detect ultralight axions um, because using traditional haloscopes, the ultralight mass regime is kind of off limits. Um, to, to get down to those really, really low frequencies, you want the resonant frequency of your microwave system, your CAN, to, to, to match the axion mass, which means when you go really small, your, your CAN is going to get bigger and bigger, and it's going to become unfeasible. Um, so to try and detect in ultralight mass regime, um, it was proposed that you could simultaneously drive two orthogonal resonant microwave modes of, of, of you know, orthogonal polarizations. So we see here we've got a TE011 mode and a TM020 mode. One will have a uh, ZB field and the other will have a ZE field. Um, and as it turns out, um, there will be two um, situations in which the axion field can couple to the two fields together, um, which is when its frequency is equal to either the sum or the difference of the two modes. Um, so in the difference case, which is referred to as axion up conversion, um, we can see that by tuning these two modes close together, we can be sensitive to ultralight axions, um, which is great. And limits were set um, in, in the uh, nano electron volt range um, by, by this experiment. Um, it was run ultra, the, the, the frequencies of the modes were stabilized to be ultra um, stable and reduce the noise of the systems and try and detect um, some phase fluctuation of these modes due to an axion coupling the two fields together. Um, the issue with, with this particular experiment is that there's sort of a distance of closest approach of this axion up conversion um, process, which is set by a imperfect orthogonality between the two modes um, where there, there does exist some normal coupling between them which prevents them from becoming degenerate um, and so i think in this particular experiment it was something like 40 megahertz was about as close as they could get to each other which which sets a lower limit on the uh the the mass you can search for um, 
So what would be ideal is if you had a, um, a resonator in which um, a single mode of the, re of the resonator contained a non-zero E dot B product. Um, and as it turns out, um, something that has a non-zero E dot B product is um, referred to as having um, electromagnetic helicity, um, the formula of which is down here. And we see that E, e, and, B, uh, e and B dot product turns up, um, it should look very familiar from, from the previous slides. Um, so, so very, very quickly, just some base definitions. Chirality is an inherent property of a particle, um, which is like your left and right hands. Um, it's all to do with mirror asymmetry. So, so mirror asymmetry and chirality um, are sort of interchangeable definitions of each other. Um, helicity depends on sort of the particle's momentum. It depends if the particle's momentum spin is aligned or anti-aligned with its momentum. Um, for a massless particle, you're unable to alter helicity by changing frames. Um, and so for such a particle, chirality and helicity are, are essentially interchangeable. But the point is, if you could generate an electromagnetic field, which has this electromagnetic helicity property, the mode itself will have a non-zero E dot B product. And this should give rise to um, sensitivity to the ultra light uh, mass range, because we now aren't relying on two modes being as close as they can get. We're relying on a single mode, um, which is yeah, gonna, gonna reduce that, um, that lower mass limit. Okay, um, so the helicity of these um, systems is born out of its mirror asymmetry. Um, and so you might wonder why a triangle cross section is is what we've we've used in these cavities, um, and there, there's very sort of simple argument to to explain that, which is that as you increase the number of planes of symmetry in the cavity cross section, you're further approximating a circle. You're getting closer and closer to a circle, um, and if you were to take a circular cross section and twist it as you extrude it, um, you're going to observe that there's no difference um, between these, the untwisted case. So the lower symmetry order, um, which can form a volume, um, is going to least approximate that, that cylinder, that circle, um, and should show the greatest helicity, um, which when we run simulations and we solve for the, the formula um, on the previous slide, we, we, we find that that's true, that for as we um, we, we have two particular different modes, a, 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 um, a positive helicity and a negative helicity mode, um, which are maximized as, as um, this triangular cross section is twisted by a certain amount of degrees. Um, and then as we start increasing the number of sides in our, in our um, cross sectional polygon, uh, we see that the helicity, the helicity falls away. Um, okay, so um, why are we calling this an anion cavity? Um, uh, the terms boson, fermion, anion all arise out of rotational symmetry. Um, and it's been shown in, in this paper here that a classical Mobius ring resonator exhibits fermion boson rotational symmetry. Um, and the argument used is essentially, um, if you imagine some eigenfunction psi n here, and you um, do one rotation of, of the straight torus cavity here, you um, come back with psi n plus one being invariant. So there's, there's um, a total phase shift of, of zero in the boson case. Um, whereas for a Mobius cavity, like depicted here, rectangular cross-section Mobius cavity, um, under one rotation, you've picked up a pi phase shift and you will only, you will preserve your original psi n function when you undergo two rotations of your cavity. Uh, so that's why this is referred to as a fermion. Um, so what happens in the triangular case? Um, well, we have um, two p-symmetries in, in the dihedral group of regular convex polygons. Um, so for D3, it's a rotation by two pi on three is going to preserve the object, um, which is what we see in the ring uh, triangular case um, is that we're going to have two pi on three um, times some integer uh, phase shift picked up by um, one trip of this cavity. Um, and in a linear case, um, we kind of have freedom to choose whatever rotation we want. Um, and the phase shift picked up will sort of be set by what that rotation angle is, uh, that twist angle. Um, and so sort of any angle can be picked up. And so that's why we call them anion cavities. Um, so, so hopefully that, that sort of explains the origin of the title. 
um, it's not particularly relevant, particularly relevant to to dark matter detection, but um, that's that's why they're called anion cavities. Um, okay, so the triangular system, um, it's a slightly odd. It's it's not often used um, shape for an electromagnetic resonator, but it has been analytically solved in the past. Um, and uh, what we find is that for the equilateral triangle, um, where we say the um, this 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 multiplication, if we multiply the base by some factor alpha um, at alpha equal to one, is the equilateral case. We see that there is a de degeneracy between the TE one 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 mode and the TM one one zero mode um, in a capped resonator. Um, these are the solutions for a infinitely long system. Um, and so, so we're talking about this mode here and this mode here, a degenerate um, in the equilateral case. Um, so, what do they look like? Those modes when we when we put end caps on on this system, we see we have this transverse magnetic mode, um, uh, which has uh, EZ component, um, and it's an EZ zero. Um, this is um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a, a TM110 mode here. Um, and we have this transverse electric mode, TE111, which has um, BZ field and no EZ field. So in, in the straight untwisted case, these are orthogonal solutions um, completely, and they have a TE and TM degeneracy um, for the equilateral cross-section. So what happens when we um, introduce our mirror asymmetry um, between... For, for this mode by twist it for this cavity by twisting, um, we observe what appears to be an avoided level crossing between these previously degenerate modes. Um, and what has been introduced is a um, electromagnetic uh, coupling between the TE and the TM modes. Um, and we now have these solutions that, uh, that arise that we are going to refer to as psi minus and psi plus, which are. Um, the TE minus TM mode and the TE plus TM mode, um, which can be seen by the fact that we've got a change of sign of our BZ fields here. Um, and so, so in the psi minus mode, we can we can see that the transverse uh, components of the electric and magnetic fields um, have some element of parallelism to each other. Um, and in the psi plus version, we have some element of anti-parallelism to each other. Um, so, we, we no longer have orthogonal modes. We've created a new orthogonality basis, um, which is the psi minus and psi plus uh, system through the introduction of the mirror asymmetry. Um, if you were to twist um, this cavity in the opposite direction, uh, you would see that the, um, the directions of these fields would swap um, accordingly. Uh, and when we solve for the helicity of these, um, these, this new orthogonality basis with the twist in our system, um, sure enough, we find that helicity is maximized um, at alpha equal to one, the equilateral case, um, uh, which of course makes sense. When we think about this as a coupled mode system, we're going to want um, some coupling to exist which is introduced by the mirror asymmetry, but we're also going to want the two coupled modes to be degenerate in frequency, to be as close in frequency as possible, um, which produces the, 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 greatest, um, the greatest amount of frequency shift of the modes um, and, and therefore the greatest amount of helicity, um, which is great. Okay, so um, that's a, that they're an interesting system, that's for sure. The, those simulation results uh, uh, show that we can um, produce some helicity and where we're, we're pretty sure that helicity will result in sensitivity to ultralight dark matter um, axions. Uh, but can we actually build these systems? Um, well, the answer is yes. Um, using 3D printing, um, we have SLM and SLA printers. Um, we can uh, build these things out of aluminium. Um, so here are three prototype devices that we constructed using um, metallic 3D printing. Um, here is our ring device that we've done using resin 3D printing and we've coated the inside with metal. Um, the advantage of moving to a ring geometry is that you remove two end faces from your system, um, which will result in an increase in um, Q factors because you're going to uh, remove one reflecting boundary condition, which is a source for loss. So um, this... Uh, G 
in the this G term in the in this table here is proportional to the um, achievable electromagnetic Q. So we can, can see we get this this improvement in the um, in the ring case here um, in in potential Q factors, um, and the helicities are, are are quite strong, quite near unity, which is really really good. Um, so we can measure um, what we did is is we measured the um, frequency spectra of these three systems, which are at discrete twist angles of 60, 120, and 240. Um, and we compared the, the frequency spectra to the simulation predictions of, of, of where these high helicity modes are, are predicted to tune. Um, as, we, as we twist more and more, we increase the, the coupling between the previously orthogonal modes in the straight case. So we expect that their frequencies will move. Um, and what we see is really, really good agreement between simulation and experiment. So we're, we're really happy with this result that we've probed the, um, the, the, the frequency spectra of, of this twist effect at, at three discrete locations and we get really nice agreement, um, which is nice. Okay, um, so now to get into sort of the nitty gritty of exactly what's going to happen if um, an ultralight dark matter axion particle enters into one of our cavities, um, we need to, to, to look at our axion modified electrodynamics. Um, so we saw before that the coupling of axions in, in we saw before in, in that inverse Primakov diagram that the coupling of axions to photons occurs due to um, the axion mixing with neutral pions and it couples to photons through what is actually referred to as the chiral anomaly. Um, so it, it, it sort of makes sense that, that a chiral system will be, will be sensitive to them. Um, the axion electromagnetic chiral anomaly um, can be described by um, this, this additional term to, which would be added to the Lagrangian of the photonic degrees of freedom. Here, um, F is um, the electromagnetic field tensor, um, A is a pseudoscalar, and we see that there's there are very familiar um, axion photon coupling term, this pseudoscalar and our, our E.B product. So, so this is why we want uh, non-zero E.B product here in all of our in all of our axion detection systems is due to this um, additional term in the Lagrangian. Um, so this is going to modify um, our electrodynamic equations of motion um, and results in what's referred to as uh, mo axion modified Maxwell's equations, which are over here on the right. Um, what we see is that where we normally would expect to just have an E and a B term and here an E term, there's now this additional term that appears um, due to the axion um, term where we, we define this capital theta as G A gamma gamma A. Um, and so, so, so we've, we've induced the axion is, is, is inducing and is sensitive to this mixing of the E and the B fields. Um, okay. So, um, if we operate in the limit of up conversion, where we assume that the mass of the axion or the frequency of the axion is much, much less than the, the frequency of our system, um, the, the pump frequency that we're going to apply to our cavity, um, we can assume that the axion signal converts to, to a weak uh, modulation sideband of the pump. Um, and so we're going to model it as inducing some upper and lower sidebands. Um, which is, which is very simple to do in terms of an electric field. Um, we can write um, the equations of a amplitude modulation and a phase modulation sideband um, being added to this, this familiar looking phaser. Um, and, and, and we can write it out in, in this formula as a, as, as a positive frequency and a minus frequency rotating um, term. Um, now we assume that these parameters MAM and MPM are very, very small, which means that we can um, still use our, um, uh, our axion modified Ampere's and Faraday's laws in their phasor forms. We don't need to include um, any sideband terms in, in these equations here. Um, and then we can apply a complex pointing theorem um, to, the, to these new modified um, equations. Um, so the pointing vector S is the complex power density, um, where its real part is equal to the time average power density, um, and the imaginary term is equal to the reactive power. So we can write S as the cross product of E and the conjugate of the B field, um, and we can denote that the real part of S is equal to um, uh, the pointing vector plus its conjugate. 
Um, if we take the divergence of S, we're going to find the energy flow out of the volume of our system. Um, and so um, we see what we get is a very familiar looking expression um, for energy flow in a resonant cavity with um, its internal fields. Um, we have this source term, which is the um, electric current density, electric field current density. Um, so this is all very standard stuff here, but then we have this additional term coming in with our axion um, axion term here, the capital theta is, 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 is modifying the energy flow. So we see that the axion can, 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 um, can put some energy into our system. Um, so we can apply the divergence theorem um, and use the complex conjugate of S um, to obtain the following expression, um, where the left-hand side here represents the incident um, carrier power delivered to the cavity at the carrier frequency. So we can say that that's simply um, the, the, the drive power multiplied by the coupling into our cavity, um, which is that coupling parameter beta is just to do with the, the impedance matching um, of, of our input signal. Uh, to the resonance system. Um, and we see that the um, uh, the incident carrier power now has our source terms as well as these axion terms, um, which is which is what we want. Um, so now if we attribute those source terms um, to the current induced in the conducting walls, um, we can relate that um, current density to the electric field. Um, this is a pretty standard um, way of doing that. Um, and we obtain the following expression. Um, and we can evaluate each of those dot products, the leading order, and we obtain the, the following expressions where we see that we have um, this one here, which is going to be um, our term at the carrier frequency. It's simply E dot E star. And then we have all of our terms at plus or minus the um, axion frequency, which are our modulation sidebands. Um, importantly, the only term that uh, remains is the um, uh, is is this um, uh, amplitude modulation sideband the phase modulation sideband terms all cancel um, so so what we predict is going to happen is that the axion will induce some amplitude modulation sidebands to our pump frequency um, which hopefully we can detect um, so um, we can we can do some 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 other pretty standard things where we say that the the um, stored electromagnetic energy in the resonator at the carrier frequency um, is equal to to these expressions here. It's just um, your your the the electric field um, squared or the the magnetic field squared with the relevant um, uh, constants out the front. Um, and if we evaluate, um, oh, let's see, oh, where have I gone? Uh, yes, if we evaluate this E dot E star multiplied by the one at the, um, uh, at omega P, we find that the power incident, um, is related to the energy in our system UP, um, via the, the frequency of the pump and the Q factor of the pump. So that, that, that first expression there, power dissipated equals frequency times energy over Q is just from the definition of Q factor. Um, and then we can see that there's just this, this coupling um, of the incident power into our system. Um, and so that's, 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 that's a very standard result that you would get for any, any resonant system. Um, now, if we want to work out what the dissipated power is in our coupling resistor, so what we'll actually read out of our system over this coupling resistor um, Z0, um, we just multiply by that beta on beta plus one um, voltage divider equation again, um, and that gives us this term here. So this is all at the carrier frequency. Um, now, if we evaluate the divergence of the pointing vector into integral um, at the sideband frequencies, which is where we expect the axion effect to occur. Um, well, firstly, we know that there's no incident power from, from our pump. Um, and so we just have these two terms. Uh, one is proportional to the imaginary dot product of E and B um, with an axion drive term uh, in it. Uh, and the other one is our modulation sideband term. Um, it's, it's the, it's the total system energy multiplied by a modulation sideband term. And so what this equation says is that if we have some existing axion amplitude, um, here, theta naught, um, and we have a non-zero E dot B product, 
um, or non-zero imaginary E dot B product, um, we'll produce some uh, amplitude modulation sidebands, which we can now state that that modulation index is this formula here, um, which simplifies down to our helicity. Our helicity turns up in this equation here, um, where, uh, where, again, our helicity is previously defined here. Um, so if we have helicity, we, we can see that we should hopefully get some uh, modulation sidebands, uh, amplitude modulation sidebands on our system, which is really neat. Um, how can we work out a sensitivity from this fact? Well, what we need to do is work out exactly what, what the power is going to be at those amplitude modulation sidebands. So from just a straight definition of um, a modulation sideband, we say that the power at the amplitude modulation sideband is going to be equal to that index squared times the power at the pump, um, which is just going to be this formula here, proportional to the amplitude of the axion source um, we see that the axion frequency also turns up in these equations uh, and the above calculation is making the assumption that we're operating within the bandwidth for the resonant mode um, which will be true in the ultralight regime so this is a really important um, thing um, in general we have to substitute um, the q to be scaled by the filtering effect of your cavity um, but you can see that this equation here for omega a much less than omega p is going to come out as qp um, but what it means is that we are sensitive to axions that have a frequency within the bandwidth of our cavity that's not to say that uh, omega a is um, equal to omega p it's, it's to say that our, our, our system will be sensitive to dc and up to the bandwidth of our cavity which is a mass range it's very very difficult to uh, achieve um, so we can define the spectral density of the axion field as um, saf um, and then we can use that to um, define the spectral density of our amplitude modulation sidebands by this formula here um, and um, we do a very standard um, means of defining the the, um, the axion field amplitude um, determined by the density the, and various um, other model parameters. Um, and if we integrate over the bandwidth of our um, uh, spectral density of amplitude modulation noise, um, and assume that our system is going to have some some system um, spectral density of noise SAM. Um, which is going to be the, the limit on amplitude modulation noise of our oscillator, for example, um, we can define our signal to noise ratio here. Um, so, so we see that we divide through, through by the square root of our noise, which is SAM, and then all this other stuff is our signal um, that's coming through at some DC up to the bandwidth of our resonator modulation sideband. Um, again, so, so there's another assumption here that a T is greater than the axion coherence time, um, which is maybe not always true for for particularly low frequency axions um, you have to measure for a very long time um, and in that case you would make this substitution here that um, you'd replace that t to the 10 to the 6 t on fa turned by t to the half um, all of that is to say uh, that if we design a oscillator based off of the um, the twisted anion cavity um, the signal to noise ratio, which we can um, plug in some numerical values for um, here, our, our brown terms are our model parameters that we're looking to constrain. Um, the blue are our experimental parameters that we have some control over, um, and obviously green are, are natural parameters. Um, we can we can make some assumptions and, and say, for example, hey, what if we had the, the 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 best possible amplitude noise limit of negative 160 dBc per hertz um, of our oscillator? Um, and what if um, if we say helicity's unity and microwave probe coupling's unity, which are actually very reasonable assumptions? Um, how and if we yeah if we measure for a week, let's say, um, how does our sensitivity, our signal to noise ratio? depend on um, Q factor of our cavities and use that to set limits on um, GA gamma gamma by setting our signal noise ratio equal one. Um, and and we, we, we achieve these limits here. 
um, which are below um, the existing um, astrophysical limits in this max mass range. Um, and so what you can see is that um, as the Q gets larger in, in these systems, obviously the bandwidth is going to drop, which means that this, this, um, this roll-off point of our sensitivity um, moves narrower and narrower. Um, because again, we're sensitive to axions that are within the bandwidth of the resonator. Um, so, so this this lower mass limit up until this turn of a point represents the bandwidth of your of your resonator um, in axion mass. Um, Jeremy, can I ask a question? Yes, please go it's ahead. It's Matt Dolan in Melbourne. Um, looking at your signal to noise equation, mm -hmm. if I take the axion frequency to zero, it looks like it diverges. Like the, um, that term in the denominator just becomes one, but there's a term which is one over omega to the quarter yes. in the numerator. Yes. Now, in the case where your um, where your axion mass goes to zero, your um, coherence time is going to be um, very very large. Um, it's going to approach infinity, which means that you need to make that substitution I mentioned before, um, where this term here is going to go to t to the power of a half, which is just your measurement time. Um, so it it doesn't diverge. If you follow me, but you're you're claiming you have sensitivity to omega equals zero when the axion, well, no, not even I, when the axion I, is not even oscillating. I'm not claiming that. I'm 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 claiming it down to about ten to the minus twenty two um, <laughs> electron volts, which is uh, below that um, axion mass, below that frequency. The 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 sort of um, the model for dark matter particle sort of stops working in general. No, because... I mean, okay, I'm not talking about the model stopping working. I'm just saying in, in principle, you're claiming that if I said omega equals to zero and yeah. there's no oscillation, then you have sensitivity there. So you're doing like a direct measurement of just the density. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say that that's true if, if the, if the, if an, an axion with if a DC axion is is a, is a feasible thing, um, then this system would be sensitive to it. Yes, um, the reason I cut off at ten to the minus twenty two is because the, the 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 sort of concept of an axion stops working. Um, I think your Compton wavelength has to become larger than the universe or, or something to this effect. Um, yeah, so I find that confusing because if I set omega equal to zero, then the e dot b term that you have it's not. A axion times e dot b. It's just e dot b, right? And that term is a total divergence. That's just a QED theta term, which is non-physical. So I'm, I'm a bit confused by that. But okay, um, I'll, I'll I'll have to take that question on notice. Yeah, um, yeah, no, 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 yeah, I'm that's, that's that. enough for that. That's um, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly looking at at, at the, the those, yeah, a, a DC axion is is not something that that we considered because, um, yeah, not not something to that we think is feasible. Cool, thank um, you. Thanks for the question. Um, um, can I can I also ask, I mean, in this, this plot, your, are you assuming, to say, does this plot apply for that formula for the signal to noise ratio, or are you taking into account the, the, um, the difference between a week's measurement time and the coherence time in the, in the sensitivity calculation? Um, that's taken into account, yes. Okay, because I think actually most of this mass range, the coherence time is longer than a week, right? I think yes, 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 yes. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's taken into account. That's taken into account. Um, that the, the, the um, you make that uh, that change in the formula there. And um, the, I guess the other thing is that to do when you when you're dealing in the case where you're, um, within a coherence time, uh, it, it's not always going to be correct to take this like time averaged value for the axion field value i mean mm -hmm. there's, there's, gonna, mm -hmm. there's a stochasticity to it right so you could just yeah. be in the case where the amplitude of that oscillation just happens to be zero it has this like yes. relative distribution do, do you take that into account too or mm, no um i haven't taken that into account um it's a good point um and you obviously you you'll win in um both senses of the signal noise ratio and that issue you mentioned if if you you know instead of one week make a year long measurement time or 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 keep extending that measurement time out right yeah okay yeah um so i'll just move on to the the um second last slide here um which is sort of to summarize um that 
what we've discussed here is, is, is using a single mode with electromagnetic helicity and therefore a non-zero E dot B product as a dark matter detection scheme, um, which unlocks an unexplored section of parameter space. Um, uh, but there's also a few other benefits of the fact that it's a single mode. Um, because the magnetic field in the system is supplied by the resonator itself, you don't need um, an external magnetic field, um, which means that you can use superconducting materials for your resonator um, without without any issue, um, which means that those sort of astronomical Q factors of Q10 to the 13 um, might actually be achievable um, because that, that 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 value of 10 to the 13 has been reported previously in a one gigahertz niobium um, resonator. Um, so um, it, it's not unfeasible, um, and it it means that this detection experiment is 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 extremely unique um, in 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 axion direct detection experiments. There's not not many other things out there that are doing um, detection just like this, due to that um, electromagnetic helicity. Um, so the next steps are optimizing Q factors and minimizing readout amplitude modulation noise um, for a detection run um, using probably our prototype systems. Um, we'd like to cool them down. They're aluminium, so they'll, they go superconducting, um, and we can try and build an oscillator based off them um, to to do our first detection run in this ultralight uh, parameter space. Um, so this work was recently published, actually only a couple of days ago, um, in PhysRev D. Um, so if you'd like to read a bit more about it, um, the link is there in that QR code. Um, yeah, thanks. So thank you very much for listening. Um, that's all I've got. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, anyone have any questions, Bruce? So thank you for the talk, it's very informative. Um, could you go back to a very early slide where you were first showing the um, the trial cavities? So you showed some uh, 3D printing machining perhaps. Yep, that's the slide, that's the correct one. Mm -hmm. um, so the top pieces I understand as you know, samples from your 3D printing with different different levels of twist. Yeah. Do you do you want to talk a bit about the um this item you've got in the bottom right here? You there? I'm struggling to hear the question. Can you comment on this? This object in the bottom right, which appears uh, yeah. to be a practical implementation with a whole lot of bolting together. Yes, yes. So that that's the challenge, obviously, of um, the ring geometry is it's not printable in the same way that the linear systems are. Um, you know, um, neither not using any traditional subtractive manufacturing techniques or additive manufacturing techniques. Um, it's you you can't just print a, a hollow. Um, uh, a hollow um, shape like that or, or the, the top roof is going to collapse in on itself. Um, so the practical implementations of, of, of having to build it in multiple pieces um, are that we do anticipate there, there might be um, some issue with, with uh, conductivity between them. Um, we might introduce some losses, but thankfully um, the modes in question that we look at, um, the, the preferred um, direction of current flow is around the cross section as opposed to along the cavity. Um, so those crease, those those joins are actually uh, parallel to the current flow, direction of current flow. So hopefully that'll be a minimal impact. So can I ask another question, a related question about this? So thank you. I, I'd been wondering if there were issues of that kind and you hadn't spoken to them. Mm -hmm. um, the the transverse dimension of the cavity here is large with respect to the radius of curvature to the the radius of the ring. So, I mean, even over a relatively short distance, you can't 
you can't approximate a stretch of ring as being as as being a straight cavity. That's right. The, the the bend is very noticeable in in whatever appropriate you know dimensionless quantity. Mm -hmm. So, do, do you want to talk a bit about that? That must muck up the that must muck up the mode shape. Um, it doesn't actually. Um, what we find in the in this particular uh, dimensioned cavity, what we find is that. Um, it actually promotes a a host of um, high helicity modes. Uh, it's not just your fundamental in, in the linear case. Um, it's the the mixing of the one 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 te mode and the the one one zero tm mode that gives you the best helicity. And then as you step up that um, z mode number, um, the helicity drops away quite fast um, because you're you're actually mixing a sine and cosine solution of the the two previously orthogonal modes. In the ring case, um, we find that that higher order um, azimuthal mode number doesn't reduce your helicity. So you actually and 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 this. Uh, this 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 particular solution we've 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 analyzed um, using simulation and and it, and it has nice nice hel helical modes in it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, anyone? Anyone else? Um, okay. Well, I'll go then. Um, so, if I understand correctly, your your simulations that you've done. Are to 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 check against your the cavities that you've built to check that the helicity that you uh, pr predict is sort of matched by the by by what you've made is that is that what the, is that the purpose of the simulations that you've done so far? I mean, the the only thing that we've been able to check so far is that the predicted frequency shift of the simulations is matching the experiments. So, so not we don't have any direct readout of helicity, um, but we have a direct readout of mode frequency. Oh, now, is of it? course, okay. the, yeah. the the mode frequency is is being tuned as a result of the change in helicity. So, so they're related, um, and we're getting really nice agreement between mm -hmm. our mode frequencies. Between... Here is um, is showing. Um, so I, one thing I was wondering, cause I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, maybe I, I would need to go through it, but I didn't fully, uh, follow up all of the steps of the calculation for the axion <laughs> signal. So I was, I was just wondering if, um, you had thought about, uh, actually just doing the thing where you basically just solve Maxwell's equations numerically in, uh, in the, in the, with like a mock-up of the, the cavity in, in the, on the computer, whether or not this if you did that, it would confirm that the the result that you get from the from your your calculation here is that something you plan to do? I mean, because I know people did way went to to deal with the sort of you know in homogeneities and you yeah know, these things. And stuff. Um, so do you plan to do that? So you, sorry, you cut out a bit there. Um, but I think I'm picking up the question is can I can we put our um axion signal into the simulations yeah. and, and and reproduce what we um, anticipate um yes that is something we plan to do we need to figure out exactly how to implement that in our finite element modeling software we've done something very similar which is to um, um introduce some um by bi anisotropy um to the medium which is kind of the same thing in, in the way it manifests in Maxwell's equations um, and we can we can see that we're sensitive um, to those but yeah haven't manifested haven't determined that as, a, as an amplitude modulation like to see does the amplitude modulation come out but that's that's a really good idea yeah and something we want to do and the other thing is this maybe also getting back to um, the, the question Matt had um, within the in the limit of the axial mass going to zero because you're picking up these like sidebands in that limit doesn't the sideband then just sit at the same frequency yeah as yeah as your pump. that's a good point yes yes it will so that, um, will that not affect the sensitivity at, at some at some point like should you expect it to, to disappear when it's basically just you know lying on the same frequency because it's a very um, small signal right so it's not it's not a comparable size yes. of mode presumably yeah, that's right. Um, you, I mean, you're going to mix down at your 
carrier frequency. So um, you know, you you're you're looking in your Fourier spectrum. You you'll you'll have yeah, you you should be able to even see a DC modulation. I think mm -hmm. um, come through on that on that mix down. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have to think about exactly the implication. And that's something I haven't considered in this work is exactly what happens when omega a goes to zero. Uh, and yeah, it's it's a, an interesting question as to what's going to happen in these systems. And I'll, I'll need to think about that. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Any further questions? Last chance. Uh, okay. Uh, so I guess that's, that's it. So thank you very much. Um,